If you would open your Bibles with me to Luke's Gospel, chapter 9. We are continuing on in our study this morning. Luke 9, beginning at verse 28, is where we we, uh, find ourselves today. Over the last uh, three weeks together, um, we've been looking at this passage in Luke 9, a passage that uh, begins back in verse 18 with, uh, with Jesus probing his disciples on his identity. Who, who, who do the crowds say that I am? Who do you say that I am? Peter, speaking on behalf of the twelve, confessed Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus went on to explain to his disciples that his mission included suffering, being rejected by the Jewish religious leadership, dying, and on the third day rising again. Um, I think it's significant here that Jesus only explained his mission to those who confessed him as Christ. If you remember, in Mark's gospel, it says that Jesus spoke clearly. He spoke plainly. He spoke in such a way that they understood very clearly what it was he was saying. After Peter confessed Jesus as the Christ, the Lord said it was the Father that had revealed this truth to him. And then uh, the Lord Jesus himself, it is, who explains to his disciples what his mission on this earth is all about. And he only disclosed that to his people. Jesus then called the crowd to himself along with his disciples, and spoke to the cost of true discipleship of the Lord. Self-denying, cross-bearing, obedience and commitment. Not Not that they earned their salvation through obedience, through these works, but rather that salvation itself results in these works. Self-denial, cross-bearing, and following are the product of understanding who Jesus Christ is and understanding what it is He has done that saved us. And if one sees these truths, who would not want to follow Him? Who would not choose to follow? We took this apart last week, and we saw that all of us as Christians are called to carry the cross, and that daily We are called to die to self. We are called to die to sin, to die to the world, to die to pride, to die to self-righteousness. On the cross, our Lord Jesus Christ died in our place and the world has been crucified to us and we to the world. Jesus flips our worldview on its head, really, when he says, whoever would save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Jesus is speaking of that pearl of immeasurable value and worth. It's worth everything. It's worth the entire entirety of your life to acquire For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? In other words, you and I, we need to, we need to be sure that, that the things that we are living for don't cost our very selves, our very soul. In Matthew chapter 10, Jesus tells uh, his followers, those that he has chosen to send into the world as his is his messengers to proclaim the kingdom. He he says this, Matthew chapter 10, verse 26. So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? 
and not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father, but even the hairs of your head are numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. That is a very relevant passage for us, for the passage that we've been studying in the last couple of weeks, because it basically echoes Jesus' words found in Luke 9, verse 26, when Jesus said, For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. In other words, to be ashamed of him is to refuse to carry your cross. To be ashamed of him is to reject self-denial as the path to follow. To fear men and what they might think of you or do to you if you're found to follow Christ. The true disciple has a healthy fear of God that eclipses all other fears. And if God is for you, why would you be terrified of men? If God is for you, who can be against you? So live for him. We ended last with verse 27 of Luke 9. I read it and I didn't speak to it at all. And I had, I had one inquisitive listener who came to me and approached me afterwards and called me on that and said, wait a minute, you, you said you were going to cover and you never said one word about that verse. I was absolutely thrilled, by the way, that somebody picked up on that and called me on it. There is a reason for it, however. Verse 27 of last week's passage um, was spoken during the very same conversation that we spoke of last week, so it needed to be connected with that teaching. Yet, verse 27 really has more to do with the passage that we're going to read today. I would say that in the closing statement of that passage, Jesus is pointing to what we see happen here in verses 28 through 36, the transfiguration of our Lord. In verse 27, Jesus said, But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Some have connected that statement with the disciples seeing the resurrection of Christ watching the ascension of Christ, seeing the church begin, seeing the the word of God spread throughout the nation of Israel and beyond. Remember, Jesus is, is speaking here at this point to both his disciples and the crowd. So the question is, did did some of those folks who were listening, hearing that, did they witness some of those things? Of course they did, yes. But I think if we continue reading we see that Luke actually connects the previous events with what we see happen today, even though that they're not said in the same conversation, they're not even said on the same day. But Luke makes sure that we do see there's a connection between that passage and today's passage. And I would argue that this is the fulfillment of the promise that some would see the kingdom of God before they taste, taste death. So... Let's just read through our passage together and glean what we can from it. Luke 9, beginning at verse 28. Now about eight days after these sayings, he took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep. But when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah not knowing what he said. As he was saying these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them, 
And they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent and told no one in those days anything of what they had seen. Let's pray. Father, what a glorious text we look at this morning. The truth of your word. Father, open our eyes and ears to hear and see what you would have us to see here in this passage. And open our hearts, Father, that we would understand it and submit to it. Father, thank you for the great hope found in this text. I I pray that you would apply that hope to all of us here today. In Jesus' name, amen. So in the the previous passage, uh, Jesus, and and remember, Jesus is, is, is priest and king, Yes, but he is also prophet. He's prophet. And and he made some prophetic statements in verses 18 through 27. He told his disciples that he was to be rejected, suffer, die, rise again. None of that had happened yet at this point. That was prophecy. It was all future events being disclosed for those who confessed him as Christ. There was also even more future, uh, distant future prophecy that he spoke of. He spoke of his return in glory, which is for us today still a future event. He spoke of the judgment when he would be ashamed of those who were ashamed of him, meaning he would deny those who deny him So he is offering prophecy of the final judgment at the time of his second coming. How do we know if we should believe him? It hasn't happened yet. How do we know? Should we trust in his words? Should we hold out hope for his second coming? How do we know? 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 and 4 says this, knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own desires, they will say, where is his promised coming? You guys are believing in all this stuff, so where is it? Come on, your hope is misplaced. That's always been the case for for Christians, right? There's always scoffers. The world around us is always mocking us for believing that this Jesus who died on a cross is going to come back. How do we know if our hope is rightly placed? In this passage, we see a few really, really powerful reasons for such hope. The first thing I would point out is the connection between last week's passage and today's. In the Old Testament, we see many, many prophets come and go. And, and we see a pattern there as well. Quite often, prophets would speak of future events prophesied. And how do you know if you should believe them? How do you know if they truly spoke for God? The test for the prophet was that if what they said would happen didn't happen, they weren't a true prophet and they shouldn't be listened to. But some of the prophecies made were of events so far in the future that the prophet himself is long dead before its fulfillment. So how do you know? How do you know what to believe and what not to believe? Very often, what we see is the prophets would give both short-term and long-ranged prophecies. If the short-term prophecy came true, then you could trust in the distant future foretelling as well. Jesus also follows that pattern. Jesus does give us some distant future prophecy. That was spoken 2,000 years ago. Some of it still hasn't taken place yet. In verse 27, he also gave a near future prophecy. Some of you will not taste death until you see. 
if the near-term prophecy comes true, then you can believe the long-range prophecy as well. Look at how Luke connects these two events. Verse 28. Now, about eight days after these sayings, you see, Luke wants us to understand this is still connected to these sayings. After Now, now about eight days after these sayings, he took with him Peter, John, James, went up on the mountain to pray. According to Luke, this is happening about eight days later. Once again, we find this event recorded for us in Mark's gospel and also in Matthew's gospel. We need to pay attention to the details they give us because they help fill in the the picture here a little bit. And if we do that, if we turn to Mark and Matthew's account of this very same event, we notice in the very first words we have a huge problem. You see, Matthew and Mark both say, six days after. Look, if we can't trust them to even know how to count days, I mean, they don't even know how to count up to eight, how can we trust anything they wrote? Right? This proves the Bible cannot be trusted. Right? Well, let's slow down and and let's consider. It was quite common... In the Jewish culture of the time, when accounting for the number of days between events, to disclose, to, to, to discount the day on which an event happened, and, and, and if you were giving, if you were accounting for time in between two events, you would discount the day it happened and the day that the future event happened. And in between, you would have six days. Matthew and Mark are proven correct. However, Luke is not writing to a Jewish audience. He's writing to a Gentile audience, predominantly Gentile audience. And uh, the Gentiles would include both the day on which the event happened and the day the next event happened. So what do you have? Eight days. It's really not that difficult to account for the differences between the two accounts. Jesus takes Peter, John, James. They go up on the mountain with him. Now, I know I've mentioned this in, in the past before, but we see this in, in the gospel accounts that, that of the people following Jesus, there are some who have a closer relationship to him than others. We see the great multitudes, and yet out of the great multitudes, we see the 70. And, and they're closer to Jesus. And then out of the 70, we see the 12, and they're closer to Jesus yet. And out of the 12, there are the three, Peter, James, and John. And they are even closer to Jesus than, than all of the rest of the 12. These three were the only three present for three events, three really significant events in Jesus' ministry. The raising of Jairus' daughter, the event we see today, and the prayer offered in the Garden of Gethsemane. Verse 29 says, as he was praying. Notice, it's not all of them that are praying, but as we will see, much like the night Jesus is arrested in Gethsemane, the disciples are asleep, and Jesus is praying. Once again, we see Jesus praying right before a very crucial event in his life and in ministry. He, he, his prayer really is a model for us uh, of the dependence we should have on the Father. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered and his clothing became dazzling white. Jesus had promised that one day he would come in his glory And here, Peter, John, and James would get a preview of the glory to come. Now, I want you to imagine yourself there on the mountain with him, and you see this. How in the world are you going to describe this to other people? What words would you use? Well, we've read Luke's account. Matthew puts it this way. He was transfigured before him, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. 
So it, it's not his clothes that are shining, but his body under the clothes are so brightly emitting light that even the clothing itself appears as light. Mark says it this way, and he was transfigured before them and his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. We call this the transfiguration of Jesus. That, that word is used by both Matthew and Mark in their accounts. It's a word from which we get our English word metamorphosis. It's a word that could be translated became other. Other than it normally was, there was a great transformation. There was a profound change that happened to Jesus' face and his body which even transformed the appearance of the clothing that were hanging on his body. I want you to consider for a moment Moses. In his account with the Lord on the mountain in Exodus 34, Moses asked the Lord to show him his glory. God told him that he would allow Moses to see a backside glance of the glory of God as he passed by before his eyes. He did, And we're told for the rest of Moses' life, his face literally shined. He came down off that mountain. He met the people of Israel. They fell on their face before him and pleaded with him, cover up your face. We can't look at it. And for the rest of his life, Moses wore a veil over his face. His face literally shined. That was but a reflection of the glory of God off the flesh of sinful man. Jesus here is not a sinful man. He is God himself, radiating in his own glory. His clothes became dazzling white. Actually, the word there means to emit light, to glisten like lightning. We see here the curtain pulled back for a few moments. Jesus' glory had been veiled in human flesh. But here we catch a glimpse of his divine glory, which we will someday, all of us in Christ, someday we're going to see this. This is a preview for the three disciples who are there. It's a preview that's recorded for us who are in Christ. And one day, all of his disciples will see the glory of our Lord. Verse 30, And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Neither Mark or Matthew mention anything about the appearance of Moses or Elijah. Nothing at all, other than the fact that they were there. Luke just says they appeared in glory, but he he certainly doesn't give us the, 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 the impression here that they're shining and emitting light like Jesus is. What's the significance of Moses and Elijah? Well, a few things, I, I think. First of all, these are the greatest of the Old Testament prophets, both of whom testified to the Messiah's coming. They would also together represent all of Scripture. When Jews spoke of the law, remember the law came through Moses, and the prophets, well, Elijah here represents the greatest of the prophets. So the law and the prophets, this is representing for us all of the Word of God. They're there bearing witness to the glory of Christ. I think that's significant for us that For you and I, all of the testimony of the Word of God bears witness to the glory of Christ. These represent the complete Word of God given to men. Notice these were recognized men as well, which tells us something of the bodies in which they came in. They were in the bodies of men. Both of these men, when they lived on this earth, experienced very unusual exits from this world. Moses 
was denied entry by God into the promised land due to his sin. And yet we're told in the book of Jude that Michael the archangel and Satan fought over his body. Deuteronomy, I think it's chapter 34, tells of of God burying Moses' body in such a way that his body would never be found. That's very unusual. Elijah, on the other hand, is a man that never actually tasted death. He was taken out of this world while he was still alive. I think that's important for us as well because I would say these two men represent two types of followers of Jesus Christ. Some, most, like Moses, will experience death. We're going to die and be raised to new life on the other side of the grave. And some will be found alive and caught up in the air with Christ when he comes just as 1 Thessalonians 4 tells us. We also see here the great hope that we have when we depart from this world. And I I use that, that word depart intentionally because that's the word that Luke uses here, speaking of Jesus' death on the cross. Moses died some 1,500 years before this event. The Lord's second coming hasn't happened yet at this point in Scripture. It still hasn't happened. And yet, there he is, Moses, alive. That should give us great hope, shouldn't it? Have you ever wondered what happens after you die? What happens? Are you going to be in limbo somewhere waiting? You know, maybe thousands of years waiting to be resurrected? No, when you die like Moses, you will be in glory with the Lord. Now, I would say you will not be instantly in your glorified bodies as that will occur when the Lord establishes His kingdom on this earth as we see in Revelation 20. The first resurrection is still a future event, right? Revelation 20 beginning at verse 4, the the second half of verse 4 They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him a thousand years. So that can't be speaking of a a, a spiritual kingdom right now that's ongoing because it has to include all for whom the second death has no power over. That would include us if we're in Christ today. The first resurrection has not yet taken place. So there's something at that event where all believers will receive their glorified bodies. That hasn't happened yet. But even still right now, the Lord is with Moses. Moses is there with the Lord in glory. Just as we see in our passage, that should bring great comfort to us. It brings great comfort to me as I see my departure from this world drawing nearer every single day. It should bring great comfort to all of us who have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. I can't tell you what it's going to be like on the other side of the grave. I I have no idea. And Scripture gives us some clues, yes, but for the most part, it's a mystery. I, I can't tell you exactly where we will be. It's a mystery. All I know is we'll be with the Lord. Great mystery involved, but I can tell you there is another world beyond the grave. There is another world beyond the grave. I can tell you that when you breathe your last on this earth, that's not the end. There's another world to come, an eternal world. There's a resurrection to come. And I don't have all the details of what that all looks like, but I know this for certain. The people of God are safe with Christ. The people of God are safe with Christ until that day comes when we receive our glorified bodies. 
This is why we can say that all our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in Christ, they're well taken care of. They're well taken care of. They have gone on ahead of us. And they are with the Lord. It is the reason that Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians 4 that we don't grieve like others who have no hope. We don't grieve like others when our loved ones pass away because we have hope. And our hope extends to beyond the grave. It tells us that that Elijah and Moses here in our passage spoke with Jesus about his departure that he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. Oh, in glory, how they must make much of the finished work of Christ. Moses and Elijah knew of the the work of Christ of redemption before it even happened. Because as we looked at a few weeks ago, this is the Father's plan from eternity past. The Father has purposed to save a people for Himself from eternity past. And He is the Lord who works all things according to His goodwill and pleasure. The word used here is the word departure. It's one that would literally be translated as exodus, exit. Of course, we're talking about Jesus' death here. The Apostle Peter uses the very same word in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 15, when he says this, And I will make every effort so that after my departure you may be able at any time to recall these things. Peter is talking about his own death. Again, I find a great deal of comfort in the idea that the Bible speaks of death in terms of sleep and and exit, departure. Uh, Death is temporary, sleep. Uh, Death is, is a departure, it is an exit from this world. It's not the end. It's merely a translation from one world to the next. In Acts chapter 13, verse 24, Luke writes of Jesus coming into this world and and, and he uses a word there that would literally be translated as entrance. Jesus, the God-man, stepped into time, his entrance into time taking flesh on himself, living on this earth of his own creation, redeeming a people for his own glory, for the, for the sake of his own name. And just as he entered, he lays down his life on the cross. Jesus exits this world to return to the glory that he had with the Father from eternity past. A glory you and I will someday witness a glory you and I will someday partake in. Verse 32. Now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep. But when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. So the three disciples were sleeping. They, they didn't witness everything that happened. They didn't hear everything that, that was spoken in this conversation between Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. Obviously, Jesus had brought them up on that mountain with him for a purpose. The purpose was that they would witness this event. Now, notice the word, the wording here again. When they awoke, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. There, there's something unique about the glory of Christ that not even Moses and Elijah shared in. He, he is unique in his glory. Verse 33, And as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. So they wake up, they see this. Peter, the impulsive one, speaks. Jesus, it's really good that we're here. This this implies that Peter is seeing something here that he has been waiting for. He's been expecting. They've been anticipating the inauguration of the kingdom. And, And they thought this was it. Peter says, let us make three tents. 
which is most likely referring to the practice of the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Booths, which Jews would celebrate annually, remembering and and celebrating God's deliverance from the land of Egypt as the people of Israel lived in the wilderness and made temporary shelters for themselves out of branches and palm leaves and the like. According to Zechariah chapter 14, this Feast of Tabernacles would be celebrated in the Millennial Kingdom. And the disciples knew that the, the prophet Malachi had written of how Elijah would come first. Well, here he is. Elijah's here. This must be it, right? This must be it. This is happening right around the time of the Feast of Booths. This must be it. It's it's taken place right before our eyes. It's good for us to be here. Now, remember, Jesus had already told his disciples about his coming death and resurrection, but Peter here seems to be thinking, listen, Jesus, if the kingdom is established right now, can't you just bypass all of that? Can't you just, can't you just skip right in, right, skip right over the cross? No need to go there. Let's just start the kingdom right now. He, he still doesn't seem to understand what we spoke of a few weeks ago. The purposes of God must be accomplished. The plan has been set. The cross cannot be bypassed. It has been announced in the prophecies of Scripture and the Scriptures must be fulfilled. Peter wants to bypass the cross just as he did when he tried to rebuke Jesus for speaking of his coming death. His mind is still set on the things of men, not the things of God. Moses and Elijah are talking to Jesus here. They're talking about the work that Jesus is about to accomplish. And Peter thinks, why not just short-circuit that? Let's just jump right into the kingdom. And I love verse 33, the the last part of that, that verse, not knowing what he said. Peter seems to have the habit of speaking before he knows what he's talking about. You know what? I can relate to that. I have put my foot in my mouth on more than one occasion. Peter seems to have an issue with that. Clearly, this is the case for him in our passage. The other thing that Peter misses here, which becomes apparent in the next verse, is the position of Jesus compared to that of Moses and Elijah. As he was saying these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my Son, my Chosen One. Listen to Him. Peter seems to see Jesus as being kind of on the same level as these two. And I want you to consider this for a moment. Peter wakes up, he sees Jesus speaking with Moses and Elijah, he interrupts their conversation to say, listen, I have a great idea that God maybe hasn't thought about. Why don't I build you a couple of shelters, one for each of you? As Peter is speaking, God the Father interrupts him. God the Father comes in a cloud, overshadows them, which represents the very presence of God, the Shekinah glory of God that we see in so many passages in the Old Testament. This cloud comes, overshadows them, and a voice, an audible voice, speaks to the disciples. Mark makes it clear that at the sight of Moses and Elijah speaking with Jesus, the disciples are afraid. And then comes along this cloud and a voice of God from the cloud. Luke tells us they were afraid. Matthew tells us this. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them saying, rise and have no fear. I bet they were terrified. Listen, if I hear a voice out of a cloud, I'm going to be a little afraid. They see Jesus shining in his glory. The voice comes, they fall on their face. 
But how comforting would it be to have Jesus come, touch them, and tell them, you need not fear. The point of the cloud and and the voice is very clear. Why don't we make shelters, one for each of you? No, 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 you don't understand. This is my son. There's a distinction between Jesus and Moses and Elijah. Jesus is not merely a prophet. He is God's one and only son. This is my son. This is my son. Listen to him. He is my chosen one. When I read those words, my mind is instantly taken to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews 1, verses 1 through 3. Long ago, at many times, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. Okay? That's good. We should listen to the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son. There's a distinction. By His own Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things, This is not merely a man speaking for God. This is God speaking. He appointed heir of all things through whom he also created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Peter is thinking that Jesus is much like Moses and Elijah here. Jesus is a a man of God. We see this same thinking throughout the gospel accounts. You'll you'll remember there's a conversation recorded for us in John chapter 3. Jesus and a Pharisee named Nicodemus. Nicodemus comes to Jesus and he says, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God. No one can do the signs that you do unless God is with him. Same thinking, a teacher from God, a prophet of God. Just like Moses, just like Elijah, the problem is Jesus is nothing like Moses and Elijah. Nothing. He is not a representative of God. He is God. Yes, the prophets spoke. Yes, they are to be listened to. But Jesus is the Son of God. He is infinitely more to be listened to, to be heard and obeyed. Peter and John never forgot the encounter on that mountain. I'm guessing James never forgot it either, though James didn't record anything for us. Peter and John both did. In Peter's second epistle, he writes this, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16, For we did not follow clearly devised myths. Look, Peter, Peter is saying, listen, there's scoffers in the world. They, they don't believe this. Right? They challenge us. Yeah, when is he going to return? You believe in this guy that's dead and, and, and you think he's going to come back? There will always be scoffers. Peter says, listen, we, 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 we did not follow clearly devised myths, cleverly devised myths. When we made known to you the power of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, we were eyewitnesses. We were there. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father and the voice was born to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved son. Peter said, listen, I was there. I saw this. I heard the voice. I am an eyewitness. We ourselves heard this voice born from heaven for we were with him on that holy mountain. Peter is saying, I was there, I saw it, man. And if you don't believe Peter, maybe you'll believe John. John, 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. The Apostle John writes this, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our own eyes, which we have looked on and touched with our hands concerning the word of life, The life was made manifest. We have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you eternal life, which was with the Father, was made manifest to us, to us that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you. Powerful, powerful testimony, eyewitness testimony. These folks witnessed the glory of Christ firsthand, a preview of the glory to come. 
Verse 36. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent and told no one in those days anything of what they had seen. After the voice speaks, the cloud disappears along with Moses and Elijah, and Jesus is alone. This is my son. This is my son. He is in a class all by himself. The disciples kept what they had seen to themselves. Some people would say, come on, really? Like they see this, they hear a voice, they keep it to themselves. That's crazy. Who would do that? I would be telling everybody I knew. Well, a couple of things here. Number one, if you told anybody, would they actually believe you? You probably think you're nuts, right? So you probably would keep it to yourself out of the fear of men. Second thing, in Matthew's gospel, Jesus says to his disciples, tell no one the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. Listen, this guy was just shining in light that is not available on this earth. They're afraid of Jesus. And he just said, do not tell anyone. I would keep my mouth shut if I saw that. And he told me, don't tell anyone. Just eight days before the event, Jesus had been teaching his disciples about his coming departure his atoning work on the cross, the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. Jesus also told them the cost of following him was very high, but it was only temporary. And the final result is glory. Here we see those very same disciples, at least some of them, just as Jesus promised in last week's text, being exposed to a glimpse of the glory of God the glory to come, proof there's life after death in God. Let me just conclude today's message reading for you the words of J.C. Ryle once again. Ryle, in his commentary on Luke, wrote these words, and I, I thought these would be really helpful for each of you to hear. He says this, Let us take comfort in the thought that there are good things laid up in store for all true Christians, which shall make ample amends for the afflictions of this present time. Now is the season for cross-carrying and sharing in our Savior's humiliation. The crown, the kingdom, the glory are all yet to come. Christ and his people are now, like David in the cave of Adullam, despised, lightly esteemed by the world. There seems no form or comeliness in him or in his service. But the hour comes and will soon be here when Christ shall take to himself his great power and reign and put down every enemy under his feet. And then the glory which was first seen for a few moments by the three witnesses on the Mount of Transfiguration shall be seen by the whole world and never hidden again to all eternity. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the truth of your word. Thank you for the eyewitness testimony that we have of Jesus Christ, um, his glory being revealed for us. Father, thank you for the preview of the glory to come for all who are in Christ. Thank you, Father, for revealing to us there is life after the grave. Thank you, Father, for revealing to us that life after the grave is as soon as we die, as soon as we depart from this world, we get to be with the Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you for the great hope that we have in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, as we come and and we think of of Jesus' death on the cross now at this time and as we celebrate uh, communion and partake in communion together as a body of believers, Father, let us think of the hope we have in Christ. We pray this for your honor and your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.